I see throughout all of nature, everywhere I see just absolute elegance. Just see, look at the design of a leaf or, a, or the eye or any part of nature, and it's just incredibly elegant design. I listened to you all tonight, and the strongest theme that came out was design. So many designers in this room. My passion around social architecture has to do with us accepting the challenge of designing how we are with each other, how we live with each other, how we work with each other, how we see ourselves. What kind of marriage do we want between what we believe and the rest of nature? I'm saying that we're still primitive in the realm of social architecture. And my passion is that we, that we step up to who we are and, and become the, the, the social architects that, that we're capable of being. I never miss an opportunity to tell a story, especially if it's about myself uh, <laughs> and my work. Uh, because, and as our friend Henry, also an architect, might very well agree, that architects sometimes have a bit of difficulty separating who they are as human beings from what their work's about. And so far it's gotten me this far along. Life still seems to be groovy, so I keep doing that. So uh, this project is about this project. It's not about me as much as I might want to talk about it. That's where the stuff is, because I call myself the founder of the Green Community Center, because like I used to do as a, as a kid, go along the curb, the streets of Brooklyn. You know Brooklyn, Rob? I you ever been there? I <laughs> yeah, okay, anybody else know Brooklyn? We all have a little Brooklyn in this, do something, think about it, right? I spent an afternoon with this charming fellow. He's got, he's, a, he's Brooklyn up to his ears. Hi, Gary. He's wonderful. I think I've been there once. Too. When have you been there so once? I live it. So, walking along the curb, looking for pennies. I found them. You take them, you go to the movies. 35 cents gets you in the Louis Kings. So, how I feel about the Green Community Center is I just found the idea. But, yeah, I don't own it. I don't give it away to anybody else who wants it. We'll all go to the movies. Some of the finding that I find, bite my tongue, I still find on the front page of the New York Times. Of all the media, it's the one I still kind of suspect might have part of the story straight. I gotta get my info from somewhere short of hiking there myself and seeing what's really going on. So I let the Salzburgers do it for me. Um, so that starts to segue into what we're really up to tonight in terms of our discussion. Because I'm going to be passing it on to David, and David's going to be passing it on to Gary, or vice versa, and ultimately back to Bill, which is why the heck are we all up to doing what we do? I say it's because we as human beings, we're here to make a contribution and to serve all the rest of us. I'm not any different from anyone else in the room. I'm just inviting you to perhaps see, say through my story, or David's, or Gary's, or Bill's, or all of them mixed together. You're up to the same thing as well, and we'd love to hear about it from each of you. So we're, we're sort of a tease to get everybody else cooking. Um, I defined for Bill on the phone the other day what I know to be contribution with a little anecdote to the effect that Bill and I, we, we'd have coffee together every morning for years and years and years and years. And, and in all that time, Bill always said black coffee. And then there came a time when he had a birthday party and I put this wonderful gift together and I had it wrapped up in silver paper with a big bow on it. And I marched in proudly to Bill's house. And I said, Bill, I didn't forget your birthday. Here's your gift. And he took out the fancy paper and he opened it up and there it was, a cream pitcher. <laughs> so he took the cream pitcher and he put it, you know, under the sink right in the cabinet, came to the next garage sale, went to cream pitcher. That's a gift. Contribution, I think you'd agree, is looking to see what's wanted and needed and fill it. Whether it's that folks are dying of hunger and starvation, 28,000 
a week. Every three seconds, somebody dies of hunger or hunger-related disease somewhere in the world. Well, shit, how long are you going to let people keep starving to death before you say, you know, I'm going to need to contribute to having the end of hunger happen, or whatever. Or I need to have that neighbor upstairs who's been quiet, crying for a week because her boyfriend doesn't treat her nicely. I've got to figure out something about it. We all have the instincts to make a contribution when we bother to look and see what's wanted and needed and then fill it. I have the slightest doubt that there's anybody in this room is really not on that excursion. Whether you're teaching or learning or listening or writing or playing the violin or even hanging out down at the candy store on the corner. <clears throat> You're holding up the stool next to the guy's little counter, but you, you, you're making a contribution. It's getting in touch with the fact that you're here for that contribution and acting on it. So what I do is not much, I don't consider it very much of a big deal. I just know how to do it. I know how to take all of these pieces and parts, put them all together and pull the handle and out come some cherries or some lemons or whatever, three in a row, just enough to put some things together. Back in New York, uh, it was a series of facilities for folks who were either low income, low income with a disability, had a substance abuse problem, and needed rehabilitation and care and training. Whether it was frail elderly, whether it were folks who were mentally disabled, folks who were physically disabled, they're folks. Well, we managed to get all kinds of facilities built uh, inexpensively, quickly, thoughtfully designed, leased to the city of New York for 20 years in a clip. Ironically, it was during the Nixon administration, of all people, you'd think. We used Title IV-A of the Social Security Act, and that's where we got most of our money from. And we got this stuff done and built and serve folks in Bedford-Stuyvesant, East New York, Brownsville, the South Bronx, oh gosh, all over East New York, as they say, Bushwick. These were all tough, tough neighborhoods. And we had often in court signed children, we had all kinds of people. And what we used were a series of buildings for distressed, abandoned sites that nobody wanted. What a concept. Today we call them foreclosures. We call them all kinds of dreary things. We call them rusted factory buildings. Just waiting, waiting, waiting for somebody to extract their thumb from wherever it's stuck and get to work. We've got, whatever, 7,000 young folks in Zuccotti Park in Manhattan right now. We've got folks in 147 different cities and county. Yesterday it was on 35 and before. So, you know, we're all up to the same game. Some of us are late bloomers, middle bloomers. I got involved in a conversation with Howard, bless him, and I'd like to uh, remind everybody that Howard is the guiding, if you need to know, Howard is the guiding angel of all this and to me an extremely inspiring, inspiring individual. Um, that, you know, there's no magic to this. Just get off your butt and go do what you want to do and get it handled. Okay? So, <clears throat> what's, is there any magic in that? Not really. I come here with all this stuff and I said, hey, check this out. Hmm? Everybody can go talk to everybody else about all the wonderful things that you are wanting to get to happen. Get them together and tell them all about it and create some shared ownership for something. Establish some agreement. Hey, hey, it's a good idea. When do I get a piece of that? Or, hey, that's a good idea. I've got even a better one. It covers the same thing. Want to know what it is? Maybe I can do a better job than you're doing so far because I think my idea is stronger. Okay, come on aboard. So we've got some of that working here. I don't know to what degree you've strolled through these sketches, but let, let me at least get down to 
the hard facts of it. The unincorporated area of North Fair Oaks, Atherton is immediately to the south, southeast. Redwood City is immediately to the north, northwest. And this is, mm, where are you? Middlefield Road, zoom, goes right through the heart of the community. It's as wide as the Indianapolis Speedway. And the car is going from Atherton, shoot, through the community to Redwood City. They can't get there fast enough to buy these, you know, whatever, 36 in a case toilet paper, because even in Atherton, they need toilet paper, I understand. And then they sh back in the other direction, never stopping, except if they have to for, there are no lights, by the way, no traffic lights for two and a half miles. But there are occasional pedestrian crossways and they blink when some folks are trying to get across the street. They keep the windows rolled up tightly. They don't look to the left, they don't look to the right. They sure as hell don't stop and buy anything. So they go from Atherton, they go whoosh through this community and they go to Redwood City where they're gonna get a bargain. And by the way, where Redwood City gets to collect the tax money, hmm? while the county, still asleep on its feet, is doing nothing about anything, or well, they weren't, until some of us got a little bored. When I say us, I've been patrolling this community for 20 years. I've gotten work done here in the East Palo Alto, East Menlo Park, by inviting other people to participate in a good idea, while well, finding out what it is they think is a good idea and getting the damn thing done. So I joined the steering committee of the new neighborhood plan for the community. I'd already designed all this stuff, managed to get a quarter million dollars out of HUD, another 50,000 out of Federal Home Loan Bank, and we're moving toward private enterprise to get some of the balance of it. We're putting together what we call a land trust, a community land trust, which will go under our building. I'll get to that in a second. And we put the steering committee together, we put the neighborhood plan together, and it's about to be approved by the Board of Supervisors for the county. And we did it by, you know, getting up and going and getting it done. Simple as that. Now the community, which is known as Little Michoacan, has in fact 60% of the population originally from the state of Michoacan in Mexico. Um, the census tract that would be an indication of the uh, average income level is extremely low. They have a preponderance of single family detached, very closely hugged homes, but they are intermixed with stuff like this. Miles and miles of this kind of eh, barely used and certainly underused properties, either a full building or a vacant lot or a semi-vacant lot and lots of fossil fuel burning automobile repair. What happens for argument's sake with this economy in here? Most of those folks who are male speak Spanish well and English from halting to none at all and all they know about are gasoline-powered engines and the cars that wrap around them. And so there are pieces and parts of those all over the place, and there are tons and tons of automobile repair businesses. But there's also a brand new Stanford University hospital development over here. And you know, there's the possibility, likelihood I think, of folks with a higher degree of education with a higher job skill level, with a higher this, a higher that, a higher the other thing. And Zach told me before the meeting, he's very active at Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Lane School, and that's not an easy thing to be active at. Congratulations. Can you imagine that when you start to have some of these folks populate schools like the Sylvia Lane School, rising tide lifts all boats, that's the basic play here. But we've got to have these folks who live in the community be ready and prepared to take on the jobs that will be there. The jobs are coming. The question is, will they be received effectively and will folks be capable of doing the work at the level it needs to be done? Whether it's little biotech assembly stuff, whether it's 
uh, a home business of one sort or another, uh, people have got to be ready. Also, when I spoke before about, I try to grab the little pennies that are left of every dollar coming out of Congress through Sacramento, put it all together and get something to happen for the folks who are there in the community. Okay, we keep talking about our new green economy and it's going to be just Shangri-La once again for everybody. Well, is that altogether the case? When you look at having the world work, the world, the world works. You know how the world works? What I found out, actually I found out in 1977, I can even tell you it was in February of 1977, what I found out is how the world works. And here's how the world works. The world works the way the world works. What the hell does that mean? Well, so far what it means is none of these folks are going to get a, even a sniff of the green economy. And it's going to be business as usual, except, you know, there'll be one graph, one curve will keep swinging up, one curve will keep dribbling down, but it's okay because we'll have folks who mow your lawn and folks who change your bed linen and folks who empty out your garbage. Well, maybe not. Maybe you'll have folks who, in fact, are prepared to take on the same opportunities that everybody else is looking to take on if they haven't already. So that's the game that we're up to here. So what we've done is got a hold of this particular building for any number of reasons, not the least of which was the owner's sort of desperate. <laughs> I didn't mean that, madam, and we haven't had closing yet, so we want to keep on the right side of her. But the point is this is somebody who didn't even live in the community, never lived in the community, she inherited it inherited when somebody in your family died. So she has no attachment to the community. So we have negotiated a good situation. We're on our way in. And in the process, what we've put together is what I would consider to be on a certain level kind of a, new, a womb to tomb situation. Namely, this is prefabricated housing. It's made in two places. Structural insulated panels, which are styrofoam with a strand board laminate either two sides, gives one a highly, highly strong structural panel. So it's made in a factory up north in Dixon, that'd be northeast. And its first project, Green Housing Community Center, which will a train people to assemble the housing and stealing a page from Habitat from here and the live in the units that they built. And this is intended to go on throughout the community and on into East Palo Alto, East Menlo Park, and all points east. We have a site along the railroad, which is an active freight site, and we can ship these panels as much as 500 miles away. After that, we'll probably sell them the design license for a nominal charge. People are trained on the first floor in the Green Community Center itself. They are community people and so far one of two populations, each of which is either formally difficult to hire or have never been hired. We have two, we'll call them final finalists for which community they'll be. They will either be returning military people from Afghanistan, from Iraq, perhaps as far back as Vietnam, or they will be the people who the state of California has seen fit, courtesy of the Supreme Court, to have released lower level felons released from prisons to the jail in San Mateo County. What jail, you ask? Well, the one for which we're going to spend $700 million to build. And I was just at the hearing yesterday telling them they were full of crap in a nice way. Brooklyn people always speak in a nice way. And what I said, along with several other people, 
hey, why can't we take just a little piece of that gonzo amount of money? You talk about rate of recidivism, return to prison, it's up at 70%. In the county, it's near 90 in the state. I have a dear friend who's got an experimental program in Sacramento. You know what his recidivism rate is? 3%. Check it, 3%. Huh? They give us a little bit of the money, and guess what? Even if we knock the recidivism rate in San Mateo County down from 70% to 60%, not just this facility, but all over the neighborhood, that's 10% fewer people being returned. So there's the economics for you folks. And for the community, where it is, is a higher level of community security, of returning community members who screwed up, made poor decisions, whatever they did, are back in the community as productive citizens. So that's what this is about. And how we get it done is we make sure that we know what the hell we're doing, A, and B, we present it in a way that how could you say no to a cute little kid like this? Honestly, how, I mean, when you made a presentation, as I did, to various groups that potentially could fund this, or fund pieces of it, I mean, why wouldn't you want to do this? I mean, uh, we've got a track record of having done this in so many other places uh, over time that it's a natural. And why do I do this? Because I do this better than most other people and needs to be done. But each of you it can do something better than most every other people and it needs to be done and you would be the best at doing it. And if I ask each of you, but I'm not going to because he's like, who's coming next? David or Gary? What? Gary, well then Gary, you make sure to ask them. But that, that's what we're looking to have happen here tonight out of this presentation is what have you folks come here with? Maybe not clearly you set out to think that you have that opportunity tonight, but guess what? Here you are, and that is your opportunity, and we invite it from you through the course of our conversation. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. It sure. looks like that's two, maybe three stories, and I'm wondering if it also looks potentially modular, like can it go farther up, or um, is it designed, the idea to be, is it two or three stories that are known? Some, in terms Excellent. of the question of density. Oh, yes, yes, yes. So yeah. um, this is 10,000 square feet. We have three renovated units. This is the housing pieces. Three renovated units here, three uh, one-bedroom apartments, and three two-story townhouses here with four bedrooms. Now, so, so far, the engineer. How did you decide on the cap in terms of density, like well, going up higher? Among other things, I know what the new uh, land use plan is because I participated in making sure that we could. A lot of what we designed here already, the committee finally got to as as uh, enabling the zoning. So. To this point, this is the height limit at that location. It's going to be sitting on top of prefabricated light gauge cold rolled steel so that each unit, which as you can see in the plan, each unit will have its own pedestal. And each member, each steel member on the first floor will be light enough for human beings to pick up without a crane. High strength bolt into place. Boom, boom, boom. We get these made up in Martinez. A fellow I've been working with for years who right now is doing prefabricated photovoltaic cell carrying carports for affordable housing. Uh, we're going to build our mock up through a grant we're working on it from the state. These kinds of projects, you know, like armies move on their stomach. Projects like this move from grant to grant to grant, not unlike lots of projects that you folks all do. So we're gonna build our mock-up full size. We're gonna have the vendors come in and bid on the various pieces and parts of what we're gonna build into the prefabricated panels. And then we're gonna recycle that full-scale mock-up. We'll get full public relations value out of building it and erecting it out in 
the courtyard. Yes, there is an elegance in design that is not observable by everybody in the field, but the people who are into it, uh, who, who are more sophisticated in the field, look at design elegance as something that achieves a lot with a small amount of uh, material or very efficiently. And that's what I see here on many dimensions is a very uh, elegant design. Some people driving by it might just look like an interesting building with some colors on it and some interesting shapes. But if you look at the multi-dimensional aspects of this, it's a, it's a really amazing tool. So thank you, Mort. That's brought a lot to me. Um, there's a school of architecture called Buildings That Teach. And this yeah. kind of takes it beyond what you normally hear about in that when you read about that school of architecture. It's not only teaching how to use the building, but it's teaching people how to build the building and how That's to right. work together. It's amazing. That's what I think is really elegant. Okay, yeah, because we do have that. Better buildings these days have an element, and I'm, I'm in a position where I try to throw that out to my partners. Hey, while we're building this building, doing these things, why don't we make it a building that teaches? And that signage, we'll put a sign here that says, look what we did here. And, and that's a very limited way. This goes much beyond that. So I didn't know I was going to do much of a presentation until I met with Mort uh, earlier in the week. But uh, so I thank him for the opportunity. And what I'm working on basically is a, a little bit smaller scale, but has a lot in common. And if you kind of imagine from about here to here, trailer. And on that trailer has 14 solar panels. and has batteries and inverters. It's basically a power generator. It's almost that big. It's a pretty good size. And that solar generator has gotten a lot of interest from agencies, police, fire, etc., etc., um, who believe that this is a valuable thing to have in emergencies. And I work with a company that tries to sell and rent these uh, solar generators. We haven't been very successful at that because they're very high priced units and uh, it doesn't pencil out very well for an agency to buy something at 70 grand and stick it in a warehouse somewhere in case of an emergency. So what I've been working on is, what do you do with that thing in the meantime? So if you imagine that solar trailer now, instead of just a solar generator, as a teaching platform, a rolling classroom that you can bring anywhere. And if you include the truck or van attached to that, and you put wind generators, you of course have the solar panels and all that, you put a water purification unit, you put refrigeration, you put all kinds of renewable energies, and now you make it a showcase. And now you take that showcase and that teaching platform, and part of the purpose of that is to teach kids about STEM education, which is science, technology, engineering, and math. And you apply those skills to them actually making products. And those products are then shipped to Africa, Afghanistan, to developing countries. And the goal for that eventually is, like Mort's developing with this teaching community, a teaching platform whereby uh, kids in the diaspora here from Africa and different countries can learn those skills, take them back, uh, and develop enterprise in country in making those products. So. By the same token, we're taking sort of a, a ruling microcosm of this idea, and we got excited about talking about that, and what Moore invited me to do was how do you integrate those kind of ideas into his project, perhaps. And so my take on that was, you know, maybe this is our new headquarters somehow. Maybe we roll this in and we integrate solar emergency response solar trailers that power some of this operation day to day. Uh, you know, these are just some ideas that, that might come out of it. And 
because I have a network of people who are in, involved in industrial design, and I think of industrial design as um, architects for products because there's a lot of things that are involved in that. So there's a lot of things that go in these buildings that product designers deal with. Um, of course, they're very familiar with materials and all kinds of ideas of how to put things together. And maybe there's a contribution that could be made by um, bringing that asset into the community. There's so much talk right now about um, food, food security or however you want to frame it. Um, and I wonder, and there are people who are renting tops of buildings to create gardens and sell food and so on. When I think of a green building, especially seeing a flat rooftop like that, I wonder if there's any possibility that there could be on top of that a food source. And if you thought about that. Funny you should mention that. North Fair Oaks and the areas that I described from the state of Michigan. Uh, at one time I was involved in the Garfield School, which is right at the southern end of that Indianapolis Speedway that I spoke to you about. That's uh, this dark spot, fittingly. It's a grade school. Right across the street is a donut shop. And for many years, what was going on was that fathers would bring their children to the school and then go across the street and stand in front of the donut shop, hoping somebody would come along and hire them for maybe half a day at a time. While their children in the school looked out the window at their fathers trying to get work. Not a hell of a good legacy, I didn't think. Well, the principal at that time was Dr. Ramirez, a wonderful man, Raul Ramirez. And somehow or other, he got to realizing that the heritage that these children had that was totally, totally uh, inactive and buried, actually, was a heritage of an agricultural society from back home. Well, Dr. Ramirez was blessed with a chunk of dirt between the school building and the railroad. And I kind of stumbled in the door and they were in the midst of taking down the second last standing farm in San Mateo County, which had this wonderful shingle clad windmill bonafide. Talk to our engineer over here. Is that passive yeah. Mechanical system or what? <coughs> very, very impressive, uh, ahead of its time system. <laughs> so before they killed this thing, and, eh, stop, stop. Hey, buddy, we're going to get this out of you. Hey, give me a day, will you? Went across the street down the block to the San Mateo County Sheriff's branch office and worked out a deal because there were wires, power lines along the Millfield Road, as you might imagine. If I could work out a, a deal where we could get a flatbed 18-wheeler in there early the next morning with the sheriff's department clear off the Indianapolis Speedway for a half hour, so we liberated this windmill, took it down Middlefield Road, the Garfield School, and it became the beginning of a farm. <laughs> Together with a couple of sheds, we turned into little display areas where the children finally had a legacy right in front of them. They saw where they came from and suddenly, though the circumstances hadn't changed, the fathers were still across the street. The context in which they were standing across the street shifted. You know, it's not a, life is just a bowl of cherries, it's not about the bowl, it's about the, right? How you hold the cherries, the circumstances. We change the children's whole sense of what their fathers were doing there. And eventually things did improve and eventually there was in fact a day worker center put together. But the legacy came out of the window. The important thing is that the educator will tell us children's legacy is very important. Isn't it? 
plus the fact that you integrated garden space into the design here. Right. Correct. But I was wondering. Coming out of that, that we're mm -hmm. still in the midst of answering your question. I there are that. small community gardens throughout the community throughout the neighborhood right. because of their agrarian background and instincts. Right. And our plan, I bet you it's almost as good as yours, was to do a live roof on top yeah. of the existing building. Was that kind of your thought? Well, I just saw a flat roof, but I didn't see any plants, and it just seems like a great opportunity. Well, There's, there are, it, it seems like a, a concept that's starting to emerge more popular. I'll be happy to send you the, <laughs> that section of the community plan, which yeah. takes advantage of that very good idea of yours. We knew yeah. you were coming with it. <laughs> and to put live roofs yeah. uh, on all of the uh, commercial buildings on the street as part of their, their transformation. Uh, and we'd love to have you participate in that. We'll tell you <laughs> Another small point is integrated into the design here. You notice that in the prior slide there was sort of a, a billboard. Well, it's not sort of. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's there. there. It actually pulls in $1,500 a month. But right now they're advertising cerveza and condoms. Uh, <laughs> And we're proposing that you say to transform it into a digital uh, information board, much like the Circle Star Theater, and you might see that. So a way to communicate to the community as people are passing, to and about the community as people are passing through. 